Today we're talking about a G.I. Joe named after an aerial fight to the death, a cross between Keel Hall and Wild Bill, a throwback with advanced tech. Let's talk about Dogfight. Thanks for watching JLS Comics. Hit that subscribe button so you can keep up with all of our weekly content. And with that out of the way, let's jump right into the story. James King was born in Providence, Rhode Island. From a young age, James was already exhibiting innate skills that would help him excel as a pilot in later years. In fact, according to his file card, King was ejected from every carnival and county fair in Alabama because he was too accurate and ended up winning too many stuffed bears. This is a product of his uncanny depth perception, coupled with his superior hand-eye coordination, and his powerful and precise throwing arm. From there, James joined the United States Air Force and went to Joint Base San Antonio, Lackland, and Texas for basic. Then Airman King received his technical training in electronics, then passed his Air Force officer quality test and was sent to officer school, becoming an O2 first LT. Officer King began wearing a World War II era Army Air Force officer's crusher cap, a classic piece of headgear harkening back to a golden age of gentlemen's aviation. It's called a crusher cap because pilots would remove the stiffener from inside the hat in order to wear their headsets more comfortably, and without the stiffener, the top of the cap would appear crushed. It gave a worn look to the cover, akin to something a veteran pilot with over 50 missions would have. In the late 1980s, a special task force called G.I. Joe was rapidly expanding and putting advanced, cutting-edge technology on the battlefield. As a result, an increasing number of specialists, operators, and agents were required to work this new technology and bring it to bear against their adversaries. So in 1989, the G.I. Joe team rolled out a new airframe designated Mudfighter. The G.I. Joe team needed an especially skilled and confident pilot to operate their new Mudfighter, and so the team recruited Officer King, call sign Dogfight, to join the G.I. Joe ranks. It was a rather unique canard-designed airframe with the unducted propeller in the rear to push the craft forward rather than pull it forward as with a front prop design. It was a small yet lethal plane capable of delivering a payload of AS-99 air-to-surface bombs or M7A cluster bombs on target with an advanced radar and targeting system that was only made more precise with dogfights, superior fine motor skills. Interestingly, the design is based on a World War II era plane but not an allied creation. No, this was built by the Imperial Japanese Navy and was intended to be an answer to the punishing B-29 Super Fortress. It would have flown up to intercept and attack the devastating B-29s with four 30mm Type 5 cannons. Meet the canard configuration, Kyushu J-7W Shinden, the Magnificent Lightning. The J in the designation indicates the Imperial Navy, while the W means it was built at the Watanabe Steel Foundry, which became Kyushu Airplane Company during the war. The Japanese Imperial Navy only built two of these, and more were planned to be built, but when the war ended, there was no more need for a super fortress interceptor. The J-7W concept was created by Captain Masayoki Saruno and was planned to eventually have a turbojet engine instead of propellers and would have been called the J-7W-2 Shindenkai. Construction began in 1944 and in just 10 months flying prototypes were taking their first flights in early August of 1945 but that same month is when Hiroshima and Nagasaki were bombed and the Japanese war effort was quickly drawn down. And though the Shinden never had battlefield experience, the concept and design eventually found its way to G.I. Joe and to Dogfight. Dogfight first appeared in G.I. Joe comic book lore with the final issue of G.I. Joe's Special Missions by Larry Hama and Herb Trimpey. The G.I. Joe team was coordinating a test flight for the USS Defiant launched from Utah's pit with Admiral Keelhaul aboard the USS Flag somewhere in the Caribbean, along with Hawk who was posted up at a new stealth base in Punta del Mocosa full of new Phantom X-19 stealth fighters. The goal was to do a flyover from orbit and see if the stealth base could be detected by the Defiant, and then, if a window of opportunity was opened, attempt a carrier landing with the Defiant. Which is kinda nuts if you ask me. The USS Defiant is based in the Lockheed Martin X-33 Venture Star, a proposed reusable launch vehicle that needed strategic air command sized runways like those at Malmstrom or Edwards to land. By comparison, 747 needs at least 7,500 feet to land and the space shuttle required 15,000 feet of runway. The flight deck on CVN-65 is a little more than 1,100 feet long, and the flight deck on CV-11, the Essex-class USS Intrepid, is 876 feet long, with really only about 500 feet of that for launch and recovery operations. Arresting cables on a carrier flight deck can catch a 50,000-pound jet landing at 150 miles an hour. An empty shuttle is 165,000 pounds, and the orbiter lands at around 220 miles per hour. So a tail hook would snap off, and the Defiant has no vertical or short takeoff and landing capabilities, so I'm not sure what wizardry the Defiant pilot payload was up to, but I'm certain it was on the minds of those on the carrier flight deck, which included Shipwreck, Wild Bill, and Dogfight with his Mudfighter. They were tasked with providing air support for the stealth base if the flyover failed and Cobra detected the operation. And indeed they did. Cobra happened to be working with Darklon and Wild Weasel who was leading a flight of Python Conquest while Cobra Condor Bombers and Stiletto Escort Fighters approached for a bombing run at the stealth base. 
Wild Weasel and his pilots launched a barrage of anti-ship missiles at the USS Flag, which were dealt with with a volley of chaff and flares and the roar of the Sea Whiz. One missile happened to get through and impacted the USS Flag amidships and knocked out the high-pressure steam system, which meant no catapult launches. That left one key for interception, Dogfight and his prop-driven mudfighter. The mighty wind from the storm coupled with the mudfighter's lifting body design and the massive unducted fan blades allowed Dogfight to put the mudfighter in the air without any problems. The problem would come with pitting his prop plane against advanced Cobra Conquest with afterburning turbofan engines, thrust vectoring, and advanced flight control and maneuvering technology. A strength that would quickly become a weakness though, as his BFM and air combat maneuvering skills would still be superior. The Mudfighter and the trio of Conquest met head on and Dogfight quickly had to get inside the faster jet's loops. Dogfight quickly banked around in a tighter turn at a slower speed to get an angle on the Cobra jets, and it worked! Dogfight cooked off two air-to-air -air missiles and took out one of the Conquests. The remaining two lined up on his six, but he had to slow down to not overshoot the Mudfighter, and so Dogfight jammed his stick forward in low alpha, taking them all down to the deck where the Conquests lost lift at the slower speed and almost went into the drink while Dogfight climbed out of that. They launched more missiles at Dogfight, and he broke right at the last second and in a roll to evade, narrowly avoiding impact. One missile banked around and locked onto a Conquest instead of the Mudfighter and slammed into the Cobra Jet, taking out the second one. But that maneuver allowed the third and final Conquest to line up for a solid firing solution and a lock on Dogfight. The kill shot was seconds away, but the USS Defiant glided in with Ace and Payload taking out the remaining Conquest with a burst from their nose cannon. The mission ended up being a success and back on the USS flag, the issue in this series ended with the G.I. Joe team waving goodbye with Dogfight front and center for the farewell on the splash page. Dogfight then showed up in the main A Real American Hero comic book series with issue 111. The team was now in the Middle East to counter Cobra who'd taken over an emirate called Benzene. For Phase Bravo of that operation, Hawk activated the air team which was Lift Ticket in a Tomahawk, Wild Bill in a Locust, and Dogfight with his Budfighter. They flew in tight over the armored team looking like they were targeting a cluster of his tanks. It was a feint. Their true mission was providing cover so the Tomahawk could drop the ninja team onto a tower behind enemy lines undetected. They then banged around and bombed the Hiss tanks as a diversion to allow that ninja team to get off the towers undetected. Dogfight was in issue 115. In that issue, Ghost Rider called Slipstream Dogfight after Slipstream couldn't remember Captain Jeffrey's call sign and referred to him as Stealthy. He then appeared as number 64 in the roster-wide group shot for Devil's Do's America's Elite series with issue 25. And it would take quite a while, but Dogfight then showed up in the IDW publishing era of ARH with issue 190. It was a brief cameo where he was seated at the command center at the pit while the command team communicated with Chuckles who was out in the field with low light and jinx. For the Bob Graves rescue op down in Sierra Gordo, Dogfight was assigned as air support along with Ghost Rider and Sky Striker who would be taking up a Mudfighter, a Stealth, and a Tiger Rat with, with max air to ground payloads. They quickly launched into a racetrack holding pattern right at the US-Mexico border until they got the green light to proceed into Mexican and Central American airspace. Wild Bill flew a big ol' Herc while Lift Ticket and Slipstream piloted a Tomahawk laden with Alpha and Bravo G.I. Joe teams while the Air Team trio provided air support. Things started to go sideways when the ground teams were ambushed and the air support group were hit by Liquidators, Night Ravens, and Condors as they tried to refuel. The Tiger Rat and Stealth were hit, then Dogfight caught a missile on his wing and he went down hard, crashing into a field right in front of a harvester. He was met by some terrorists who tried to capture him and steal the maps and encryption data from the cockpit of the Mudfighter, but Dogfight blew the Mudfighter before they could. They then threw Dogfight in the back of a truck where the other two pilots were already tied up and held captive. Thankfully, everything was fixed when the relief team and Bob's wife Lola Graves arrived to rescue everybody. With everyone down south, Cobra had used the opportunity to invade the pit but were driven out by a few skilled operators and Dogfight was back on base for the subsequent cleanup operation. Dogfight then flew with Wild Bill and a C-130 Hercules to drop a team over the dogleg between Prupistan and Rudatistan. That team was Outback, Throwdown, Bazooka, Dusty Clutch, and Covergirl, along with their vehicles the Wolverine and Humvee. In issue 222, we learn that while not out on a mission, Dogfight is the pit's acting ATC, air traffic controller, which explains why he was in the command center in issue 190. Then a while later, Cobra attacked Fort Wadsworth and captured Sean Collins' throwdown, and so Duke at the pit in Utah activated the only aviation assets they had in the New Jersey area. That would be Ace and a Sky Striker, Slipstream and a Conquest X-30, and Dogfight who was now flying a Storm Eagle ETF, Advanced Tactical Fighter, around Long Island Sound in Pawtucket. Mainframe quickly vectored them all in for an intercept. They got word that the Aspen transport helicopters had gotten Night Raven, Rattler, and Mamba escort, so Ace took lead with Slipstream as his wingman and Dogfight in a support position, so Slipstream was at Ace's 4 o'clock and Dogfight at his 6. 
ace over the ICS till dogfight, he was about to have the opportunity to justify his codename, especially since he only had two sidewinders on his hard points. A product of them being on a training mission and not a combat mission, at least initially. They were going to engage, but Duke had them fall back but still keep within visual range. That's when a Night Raven and two Rattlers broke off from the Aspen formation to engage the Joes, launching a volley of both radar guided and heat seeking missiles at them. Dogfight was hit and forced to eject, but then the other two were hit as well and their chutes deployed and they floated to the ground as Throwdown fired on the Cobra aircraft using the cannons atop an undersong hiss tank. And though he crashed, Wild Bill certainly has many more crashes under his belt and he still has his wings. So that's the latest, but certainly not the last time we'll be seeing Dogfight in G.I. Joe lore as we move into the future. On the action figure side, Dogfight had a single figure released. In 1989, Dogfight came carded with the Mudfighter. He was reissued that same year in an exclusive vehicle 2-pack for Benny's which included Dogfight's Mudfighter along with a Cobra, his 2 tank, Track Viper, and two other figures. And due to the timing of Dogfight's release, he was never animated, although the way he's depicted, quite the characterization. And so with that, that's a wrap on this my friends. Thanks for watching, don't forget to subscribe and you'll be one of the first to know when I upload videos just like this every week. I'm Jesse, this is JLS Comics, and I'll see you soon.